Hi, I'm Loretta Bruning, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. Welcome to A Productive Conversation. It's me, Mike Vardy, and this episode has been months in the making. It's Loretta Bruning who is joining me on the program today. She's the founder of the Inner Mammal Institute, and she is uh, the author of many personal development books, including Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. Her work has been translated into eight languages and is cited in major media. She's helped thousands make peace with their inner mammal. The Inner Mammal Institute offers videos, podcasts, books, blogs, multimedia training program. Wow. And a free five-day happy chemical jumpstart. I'm happy to have this conversation with Loretta today. Uh, Let's get to it. Here is my conversation, which is another productive one uh, with Loretta Bruning here on A Productive Conversation. Enjoy. Loretta, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. So last time we had a productive conversation, it was on the Productivity is Podcast way back in 2015. You were, you were, we were one of the earlier guests just past year one. So it's been a while. Um, what, how have things gone in the last six years there? We'll just start there. How have things gone in the last, you know, last six years since we spoke? I mean, we've been through, I guess, the throes of a pandemic that we didn't necessarily anticipate, but beyond that, what else has been going on with you? Well, I finally achieved sort of my life dreams. And in my elderly years, I have to say, I've always been a writer, but I never got published. And finally, uh, when we had spoken, I was more like, darn it, I'm just going to self-publish because that was finally a thing. And when my first self-published book didn't catch fire, I wrote another and another. And slowly, I got publishers and got readers and kept writing more books. And we're going to talk about one in particular today, because this is one that we, we haven't really touched on too much in terms of having conversations on this program, but yet it, it harkens me back to some of the things I used to do when I did improv and this idea of status battle. It's actually a very common improv game and uh, it creates a really interesting scene because you have to know who's the high status and who's the low status. But that can flip. Actually, some of the best improvised scenes with status battle is when the low status person suddenly becomes the high status person. So it can be very entertaining. But when it comes to status, it's not always the case. I want to know, why did you decide to write status games? What was the the impetus for you to say, this is the book that that, that I now need to write? So I write about all of the happy brain chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. Serotonin is the one that rewards you with a good feeling when you raise your status. This is not the way it's commonly understood, but all of my books explain the biology behind that. Now, this is the most challenging one, I think, because how can you stimulate your serotonin and get that good feeling of being a strong monkey rather than a weak monkey without being a jerk and doing things that will hurt you in the long run? So that was the mission of the book. So, you know, when I think about status, especially when it comes to productivity, often what comes to me, you know, especially when I'm working with clients is this idea of my boss gives me all these things to do. And because they're my boss, I feel beholden to do them. But yet there's obviously, you know, for most of these people that they don't recognize that the boss isn't really paying attention too much to what they actually have assigned to them. So for example, I've had uh, I, I was doing a workshop once where the person said, like, my boss has given me 14 things to do today. They just keep piling on and piling on and piling on. I'm like, well, have you communicated back to them? What, you know, which of these 14 things is is the most important? Because it won't just be what they tell you. It'll be how they tell you. It'll be the way they respond. Can you touch on that? The idea of like the importance of maybe like when it comes to status, the importance of, of communication, I think from both sides of the coin, right? Like, I think that that plays a, a massive role in making sure that, that, you know, either those that are playing status games stop, right? And you touch on that in the book, but also those that, that are kind of being victimized by those with a higher status, how they can level the playing field a bit if, if that's the need that, that, that they need to, to take care of. So the focus of my work is on the communication between the human part of your brain and the animal part of your brain. The animal part controls the chemicals that make you feel good and bad, but it cannot process language. 
So the part of your brain, the human cortex, where you talk to yourself, yap, 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 doesn't really understand why the chemicals are turning on and off and what makes you feel good and what makes you feel bad. So that's the challenge. Now, when your boss piles on all this work, you trigger bad feelings, but why are you trigger triggering those bad feelings? Well, if your boss gave you some great opportunity that you thought would raise your status, then that would trigger your serotonin and you'd be thrilled to do the work. But if your boss gives you work that you see as an obstacle to your happy chemicals, as an obstacle to getting the rewards that you seek, then it triggers your unhappy chemicals. Now, all mammals care about their status because our brain is designed to seek the happy chemicals. So that means your boss is also trying to do things that stimulates their happy chemicals. And it's very sort of relaxing even to see your boss that way. Like they're just trying to do things. You're sort of a pawn in their quest to raise their status. But the minute you think about yourself as a victim, you are destroying your serotonin, stimulating your cortisol. So you really have to take responsibility for I am the navigator of my life and I am looking for steps to raise my status just like everybody else. And you could say, oh, well, that's not true because you may not be looking for this kind of status, but you're looking for this other kind of status. So one of the challenges that I, I come across, I'm sure you do too, when you're dealing with this kind of stuff is people not taking the time to take, the, to, to take into account those thoughts, the pace, the cadence, the rhythm of the day. It's like, I don't have time to think about that. I'm just going to respond, respond, respond. What's the danger of just dealing with reactive responses to these sort of things? Instead of, instead of taking like a moment, a beat, whatever it takes to start to think, well, wait a minute, what does this really mean? How do I, how can I get what I want out of this? Or at least, um, Stop, for example, that victim men thinking mentality that you touched on as well, among other things. So to stop and become aware of your own responses and their deeper roots is a huge skill and it's tremendously valuable, but it's harder than we realize. So that's why we could be a little bit self-accepting about it. One reason that it's hard is it's not just the time thing. We often use that as an excuse, but it's scary because when you go into your habitual thoughts, you do that because that made you feel good in the past. So when you leave that old road, you go into thoughts that maybe were a little scary in your past. Um, simple example, what they call defensiveness. So your defenses are there for a reason. When you depart from your defenses, then you feel undefended. But the good thing about it is those defenses were built when you were a child or a teenager because that's when our neuroplasticity is high. So you can think of yourself as a strong adult that is now able to go back into those old thought loops and rethink them as an adult and not feel so threatened by them. And that frees you to carve a new pathway through your jungle of neurons. I want to circle back to the... the the structure of status games, the book, you've, you've divided it up into three distinct areas. You know, why status games are relentless. I love the term relentless, by the way, how our brain creates status games and then healthy alternatives. Why, why was it important for you to make sure that people knew or understand why status games are so relentless? Like, I mean, cause I, I it sets the tone. Why do you think that was so important as you put this book out there? Well, I do explain the biology so people can find it in themselves, but people don't want to find it in themselves because it undermines your feeling that I'm a good guy and those bad guys are uh, seeking status, but I don't do that. So I have to show that everyone does it. And now many people have learned to blame things on our times and this current period in history. So I have to show that animals do it, and then I have to show that humans have done it from the beginning of time so that we accept it as a natural thing. And the more we accept it inside ourselves, the better we can manage it. The more we pretend it's not there, the harder it is to manage in yourself. And we, we've covered the, the, the power of serotonin and cortisol and, and the role it plays, but in part three, you get to the point where you're saying, you know, like, here is a healthy serotonin mindset. Now, I would imagine that that 
again, as you go through the book, like you'll get to the point where, okay, now what's the, like, how do I get there? Uh, I don't necessarily want to dive. I don't want to spoil all the efforts of the book for sure, but I do want to, um, I, I think one thing that would be helpful for people is to maybe understand how this is an ongoing evolutionary thing as opposed to a one and done proposition, right? Like, so for example, I was actually listening to this the other day and I, I try, I try not to share this kind of stuff because it might appear in my own books or my own writing, but I was listening to the podcast, the plot thickens, which is from Turner classic movies. And they're doing a whole thing on Lucy right now, like a whole story of Lucille ball. And the one thing she said was sad news is best said simply. And the first thing I thought of was, I'm like, I love that phrase first off. And that's, you know, but, but what came to mind was when I tell people your to-do list will never be done until you're done. Like until you are done, like that's it. Like you will always have something to do. And when they get that message, they're like, oh, crap. Like <laughs> not so much, like it's like it, it, there's this revelation, right? So when you talk about the healthy serotonin mindset, it's like I, I, I would love for you to kind of expand upon the fact that like, okay, this is not something you can win. This is not like, okay, I'm done. Like it, there is this um, perpetuity to it until, again, you're no longer present, right? Yeah. So in my book, I use the famous example of you're a young actor and you think, I will be happy forever if only I get a leading role. And then once you get a leading role, it doesn't really make you happy for more than a few days. And you think, oh, I'll be happy forever if only I win an award. And then you win an award and you think, oh, I'll be happy forever. But it, it only lasts for a few days. And then what? You're miserable worrying about the up-and-coming new actors who may steal your fame and glory. So the mammal brain is always looking for ways to stimulate the happy chemicals, but they're metabolized in a few minutes, and that's why we all have this treadmill feeling. We're always seeking, 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 and that's how our brain is designed to work because in the state of nature, there was no supermarket, there was no refrigerator. You had to seek food constantly to survive. You had to seek firewood and water. So we have inherited a brain that's designed to seek. And when you stop seeking and stop stimulating happy chemicals, bad thoughts come to you because the Bad feelings of your past build huge pathways in your brain. So that's why we are all addicted to being busy because we don't want to go into those bad thoughts. And um, so the most we can do is refocus our attention onto what is my best next step. So my next step is what can stimulate my happy chemicals. But the next step I wired in when I was young may not really be good for me in the long run. So that's what all my work is about, how to wire in new choices about your best next step. I want to depart for a second. And because as you were talking about that, I started to think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I've often thought, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, is is that the lower two tiers, the lower, when I say the lower two tiers, again, there's status. The, the, two, the two tiers, one about, you know, like food and shelter and all that stuff, and then security, those to me are like survive, like I, we need these to survive. Level three to me, which is like the need for relationships and, you know, those kind of things, love, all that, that's where things start to shift towards, you know, humans as opposed to just necessarily mammals. Like there are some mammals that require that. We, we know that, you know, I mean, there's certain a a mammals that, you know, animals that mate for life, et cetera, et cetera. But now it's not just about survival. There is this element of thriving that comes. And then when you get to level four, which is, you know, self-esteem and level five, which is the self-actualization, it's like, oh, this is, this is thriving. But we're often, you know, we tend to, and at least, uh, again, I'm being general here, but um, the idea of staying at level one and level two is playing it safe. Like we just need these to survive and we'll be fine. It's, and when we try to push ourselves to those thriving ones, level four, level five, there's that primitive part of our brain, the part that goes, no, 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 no. Doing that is really hard. Like, let's not, we don't need to do that. We, we, we only need to do these. What roles do you think the happy chemicals that you talk about, like play in that? And do you, do you kind of look at those, that hierarchy and say, yeah, there's some, there's some elements there that involve status that kind of you know, play a role as well. So people like um, Maslow, by the way, somebody told me about an interview with, with Maslow where 
uh, with a friend of his where he said that he doesn't even believe in the hierarchy himself, but it, it, it was popular. <laughs> um, he was really um, focused on political ideology and said things that promoted his ideology. Now, the idea is that if you call it self-actualization, which is a grand word, academics love these kind of things, but it's really power. Self-actualization is the freedom to do whatever I want. Now, when you are a toddler, I, I have grandchildren now I, around toddlers, and they want what they want, right? And why shouldn't they? We all want what we want, but it's not realistic. So we all go through life learning that we have to sort of negotiate compromise that if I just tantrum and demand what I want in this minute... I will lose other things that I might want even more later on. So we all learn to manage that balance. And whatever ways we learned by the time we were an adolescent, that sort of um, stuck because our neuroplasticity peaks in adolescence. So everyone is capable of observing their own patterns. And when you see your pattern and you think of your adolescence and your childhood, it's like, Oh, so I'm seeking status in the way that worked for me when I was young. And even like different, one toddler gets rewarded for tantruming. Another toddler gets rewarded for negotiating. Another toddler gets rewarded for shutting up and not asking for anything. So, and then you could think of different adolescent alternatives. So um, the, the pleasure in life is... Again, in your next step is what triggers your happy chemicals, is in accepting that nothing you can do will stimulate them forever, and choosing next steps that you have confidence in, so you're not triggering your threat chemicals, but and next steps that don't have bad long-term consequences. Now, you mentioned the lower survival levels, and the interesting example of that that I think of is getting up and going to the refrigerator whenever you feel threatened, <laughs> because, uh, what, <laughs> because whatever is bugging you, it's hard to figure out with your verbal brain. And even if you could figure it out, maybe you don't feel like you have the power to do anything about it, because when you were maybe an adolescent, you felt powerless. And going to the refrigerator is one thing you can do. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And there's agency there, right? You can pick whatever you want. So there, there is that. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I mean, the brain is such a, uh, it, it, it gets us what we want. It also keeps us from what we want all at the same time, depending on and, and those patterns matter, right? And, and it's really impossible to quote, get what we want, in the sense that we cannot have endless happy chemicals and no obstacles. That's not realistic. And also, um, the, the chemicals often conflict with each other. For example, there's a natural mammalian urge for social acceptance and then a mammalian urge for social importance. And sometimes when you take a step toward one, you may feel that you're undermining the other. And so we all have to make these balancing acts. So this is, this is, this is interesting because we talk about this you know, in roles, right? Like, so for example, I have my friends that live here in the city I live in that are not entrepreneurs, they're business, they're buddies that we hang out with. And then there's the ones that I hang out with online that are online entrepreneurs. And they're very different, quote, animals. And in certain situations, you like it's there's this ebb and flow, right? Like, you know, where I know that in one situation I feel one way, and in another situation I feel another. Sometimes, you know, like when I'm, you know, Again, a great example, most of the people that I are friends with here, they work for government. They have stable jobs. They've got this, you know, and they have this understanding that when my day is done, that's it. And I'm like, well, if I don't work, I don't get paid. Like I like my day is not as, you know, routinely structured as yours and nor do I have the stability. But then, you know, I'm also the guy that's not going to necessarily. And, and this is interesting. I love to hear your thoughts on this is I'm also like when when I get an email saying, my God, I found you on LinkedIn learning or whatever, and you've got a course there and that's amazing. And I'm like, part of me is like, yeah, that feels great. But then there's like, well, yeah, but I don't want to overplay that. Right. So the, the way we interact, I think plays a huge role with the different groups or social, you know, situations that we have. Right. How do we, how do, 
is there a way to kind of, um, n- there, I, I don't know if there's a way to know exactly what to do, but how do you navigate it, right? Yeah, it's very hard. I totally agree. The, I, I just wrote like this gratitude Thanksgiving letter to my readers of how grateful I am to them because I can't even talk about the inner mammal with real life people that I know in the flesh. They don't want to hear me telling them how they feel. <laughs> yeah, but most people, so, productivity so, stuff is the same. People are like, I don't want to hear about that. You don't live in the, quote, the real world, Mike. I'm like, what are you talking about? Anyway, <laughs> keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet, if a person mostly conducts their relationships online, that has its flaws. That's why, um, you know, often I, I meet um, readers in person when I travel to different cities. But when you know them in person... They are just someone with their own complications. And if I lived near them, there would be complications. So the bottom line is each brain is wired from its own unique individual experience. And when I look at the world through the lens of the neural pathways built from my past, I think I'm right. You know, (laughs) I think that my way of seeing things is just normal. And then when I interact with other people, like, wow. They say things different. So with each person I'm with, I can find an overlap. And then when I'm with another person, I can find another overlap. But it's work. So there's only so much time we want to invest in in staying in the overlap we have with other people, which means we have to sort of hold back the rest of ourselves. And it's a choice that we're constantly making. I love that idea of staying in the overlap because it's true. Yeah, there's 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 definitely that. And then, of course, that leads people to question whether work-life balance exists and all that stuff. And I, but I, I'm with you on, like, the way you mentioned that there's no way, like, we can't always get what we want because there's this, it, it, it's ephemeral to a degree, right? Like, it's it's just these moments. Someone asked me the other day, like, what do you think about work-life balance? I'm like, it's not about the balance because you cannot balance constantly. That's why it's called balance. It's about what you do in those moments of balance because it only happens in moments, right? Um, But what people have done is they said, well, there's no such thing as work-life balance, so maybe it's work-life integration or work-life harmony. I'm like, but there's still, like you just mentioned it, the overlap, and you can't stay in that overlap for too long because of the because there's some, I guess, like you said, there's there's some removal of self from that, right? If you stay in that too long. Yes, and the important thing is not to resent the other person. So you're doing it consciously. You're saying, when I'm staying in that overlap, I'm I'm sort of underplaying the rest of myself, withholding the rest of myself. And th- in the modern therapeutic culture, we feel like we should be our full selves in every minute. And then if you can't be that you resent the person and you think something's wrong with this relationship, it's not fair, it's their fault, and I should cut off everyone I know and find these perfect people who will allow me to be my full self in every minute. And it doesn't really happen. And interestingly, I just saw a great example of this on a TV show I was watching where the person had a success in her life and the teacher show, uh, told her to share that success with the class. And she said, I can't do that because then they'll hate me for getting above them. And the teacher said, no, we're here, we're about solidarity and support. And so she shared it with the class and they all went out for drinks without her and cut her off. Yeah. I remember sending an email once and I celebrated something and I got an email back from someone saying, well, it's not all sunshine. Like they, they, they barked back. I'm like, whoa, because it's, it, you know, it was, it was an interesting it made me. It made me think twice about doing so in the future. Now, yeah. before we wrap up, uh, there's a couple things I want to get to. One is this idea of empathy and sympathy, which I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, I've been following Brene Brown, Brene Brown's work for a while, so I mean, I know she talks about empathy and shame and things like that. Um, and there's that video which we'll link to in the show notes, where it talks about empathy and sympathy and the difference between. But then some. I was at a oddly enough where there was overlap. I was at a, a, a gathering with my family, and I went to a, someone's house and someone who studies behavioral, um, like some behavioral elements of, of, of human behavioral elements, talked about Paul Bloom's work against empathy, where he talks about. Now he's not against empathy, but he's. He, it's all about compassion, right? Like compassion is kind of the so. I'd love to hear your thoughts when it comes to status about empathy and sympathy, because I think that 
from what I remember, and and again, I'd love love to hear your insights, is that empathy kind of to some degree puts you on the same playing field where sympathy is all about, oh, I'm, I feel so sorry for you, which has made me think about like when someone has, so when someone dies, they, you know, on Facebook or a family member dies, I'm always, I'm always loath now to say, I'm sorry, even though I am, but because I don't want it to. So, but I also don't want to say, well, that sucks because I'm not necessarily with them in it. So it creates this really interesting mental dynamic in my head where I'm trying to do some mental gymnastics just to say, Hey, I feel, I feel for you. Right. So I'd love to get some thoughts on that. Cause I, again, it's, it's fascinating to me. Sure. Well, I, in a way you're alluding to this new culture where nothing you could say is right because other people are always offended because getting offended is the new status game. That's the way that you can one up other people. And that's what our brain is always looking for is that one up opportunity. So the other person finds fault with what you say. Now, it's, it's, um, there's this other culture of moral superiority where you're supposed to pretend that you have no self-interest whatsoever and you only care for the happiness of others. This is a one-up status game. I'm more moral than you are. I have more compassion than other people. And all of my suffering in life is because other people are not compassionate. So it's really a selfish thing because you're always judging the compassion of others and you're always using the lack of compassion of others as the excuse for your own failings. And, so it, And it's just, subtle and it's subtle too. It's not as overt as some of the other ones. You have to really kind of be like, if you hear it often enough, it's like getting banged over the head. We're like, wait a minute. But yeah, it, it presents itself far more subtly, right? Yes. And so in the interest of time, so what's the solution? So in the privacy of your own mind, that you can take pride in things you've done and not wait for the world to applaud you. Because I studied for many years, I read a lot of biographies and I learned that everyone in history who has accomplished anything was not applauded while they did it. Maybe they were applauded after they did it, or maybe they were applauded after they died. So if you waited for the world's applause, you would never do anything. And yet we have this therapeutic culture where people think, oh, I should be nurtured. I'm not getting anything done because the culture is not nurturing me. So it's not a healthy perspective in my opinion. And we have the opportunity and the freedom to take pride in our next step and stimulate our serotonin that way and not expect others to pat us on the back all the time and also not resent others for not patting them on the back. And you know what? If others don't take pride in what they do and they feel like the little monkey, then it's not your job. It's not your responsibility. And if they blame you for their one down feelings, that's our therapeutic culture that has taught that has allowed people to blame their feelings on the world and on society but we have the power to take responsibility for our feelings and to manage them we we could definitely talk more on this but i know in the interest of time we'll wrap things up but i want to ask one last question because at the tail end of the book just uh, something came to mind about an actionable piece, and it lends itself quite nicely after what you just talked about, maybe in an antithetical sort of way, but it still does. Helping others escape status games. Like, what is one thing, one thing that someone can do if they were to start, like, if they're like, I want to walk away and help someone escape this kind of trap, right? What is one thing someone can do today to kind of help someone else? So I've learned, I've learned from the animal training world that you always reward the behavior you want rather than the behavior you don't want. But that's harder to do, so people often do the opposite. Simple cliche is to give a person a hug when they're down, and then you train them that we give each other support when we're down, but nobody gives you support for going for it. Instead, they say, oh, that's risky. You sure you want to do that? Who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. So um, when uh, we also have mirror neurons that learn from others. So when you take courageous action, others will mirror you and you will help them 
by letting them see you take courageous action. And also, again, try to reward people when they take that courageous step rather than when they're cowering in fear. Loretta, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for taking the time today. Where can people pick up the book and where can they keep up with you and your work? I have a website called innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And you'll see the book. And if you click on that, it will have a free introductory channel uh, chapter and links to buy it in all the usual places and um, many resources of chat about the book, which this will be on there, certainly. Loretta, thank you so much for having a productive conversation with me today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks to Loretta for joining me once again on the program. Uh, You can find all of the links worth exploring, any of the other stuff that we discussed through our show notes link, which you are probably looking at right now on the podcast app you're using, but you can also go to productivityist.com slash podcast 422 to make that happen. And that way you can check out everything that Loretta and I discussed, all the stuff that's worth exploring, and there's plenty of it. Uh, The other thing you can do right now is hit the subscribe button on the podcast app that you're using right now. Or if you go to the page that I just mentioned, you could subscribe there as well. That way you don't miss a single episode and you can go through the archives quite easily to find past conversations as well. I'm joined by Michael Clinton on the next episode of A Productive Conversation. It's one that you don't want to miss. It's another conversation that's been months in the making. We've got quite a few in the catalog as I work on some pretty big projects. And having Michael on the show was a, was a real treat. I don't want you to miss that one. By the way, the other thing I don't want you to miss is a chance to support our sponsors. It's another way that you can support the show. So go to productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors to check out all the sponsors you heard on today's episode. That's it for today's episode. I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation. Thanks for joining me. And until next time, don't forget to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.